Welcome to the ACF Chess Forum. We appreciate all of you tuning in today for this webinar with a focus on food as medicine. Today, our presenters will take us on a transformative exploration of culinary medicine and unravel its essence, potential, and the crucial role chefs and the American Culinary Federation play in amplifying its impact for the greater good. ACF is excited to have an expert here with information just for you, the leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a note, we will be answering as many of your questions as possible after the presentation. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and use the Q&A function anytime during the session to pose questions to today's speaker. Let's get the discussion going in the chat by telling us where you're coming, where you're tuning in from today. I'm Chris Tanner, American Culinary Federation's Executive Director. Let's meet today's guest, Chef Jim Perko, CECAAC, is a 1977 graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, has dedicated 39 years to the Cleveland Clinic pioneering evidence-based culinary medicine initiatives in collaboration with physicians. Jim provides extensive culinary medicine education for various groups, partnering with Dr. Michael Roizen in over 113 episodes of In the Kitchen with Chef Jim and Dr. Mike. His contributions include studies on cooking and nutrition education for health, lifestyle education, and nutrition for seniors, and teach teaching culinary medicine to medical students. We will also be hearing from Dr. Michael Roizen, a Phi, Theta, Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Williams and certified in internal medicine and anesthesiology, who served as Cle Cleveland Clinic's chief wellness officer from 2007 to 2019. With over 190 scientific publications, four New York Times number one bestsellers, and contributions to groundbreaking works like Where to Eat When and What to Eat When Cookbook, co-authored by Dr. Michael Krupain and Chef Jim Perko Sr. Dr. Roizen fo focuses on longevity and health. Our final presenter is Gabby Shipta, CC, serves as a sous chef at the Cleveland Clinic Centers for Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine. As a Serve Safe certified and professional culinarian, certified professional, Gabby, the 2020 Les Dames Escoffier Cleveland Chapter Scholarship winner, is an active member of the American Culinary Federation. She assists, patient, she assists patients and guests during shared medical appointments and special events, contributing to the development of evidence-based culinary medicine curricula with Chef Jim, Chef Jim Perko and Centers for Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine physicians at the Cleveland Clinic. We have a lot to cover, so at this time, I'll pass the presentation over to Chef Jim Perko. Chef, take it over. Okay, thank you, Chris. And I wanna say thank you, Gabby, for presenting and thank you, Dr. Roizen, for presenting. So we're gonna begin. Uh, this is Dr. Michael Roizen, as you just heard, he's gonna go first because we want you to have the science first. And then I'm gonna show you how we apply that science to all the patients and the people in the communities that we serve with at Cleveland Clinic. Take it away, Doc. So this is really food is medicine gives rise to what Jim calls culinary medicine, that is helping people stay healthy by what they eat. Um, one of the, uh, if you will, hallmarks of this was our CEO, Toby Cosgrove, shown here, who we are in the sickness business, we need to be in the health business. And that started the Wellness Institute and allowed us to do what we do. Um, if you will, Toby long ago and got in trouble for doing it in 2009, say obesity now accounts for 10% um, of healthcare costs, over 147 billion. That was in 2009. And um, we could provide a lot of healthcare if we didn't have smoking and obesity. It's increased. And in fact, Cleveland Clinic employees lost over a million pounds, 144,000 in that one year under the program. So we're really gonna talk about, you can have a do-over because of food. And it is that no matter how old you are, no matter how old those you serve are, you're going to be able to be younger again. Um, that is, when the clock says 90, you may be able to be 40 again. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the brain. And on this side, pre-stress, you see a brain cell with all the arborization. 
it's like a tree with branches and roots, but it gets pruned with stress. It also gets pruned with inflammatory foods. And that's what we're going to talk about because you as a chef can improve or degrade cognitive function in those you serve. So the keys, if you will, in our seven basic rules. One, food is a relationship. You wouldn't marry someone who is trying to kill you every day. You shouldn't eat food or serve food that's trying to kill you every day. Only eat food you love and that loves you back. Two, nutrition is food choices, portion size, and timing. We're not going to get into that. We're going to get into the ones in yellow. The number point three is there are only five foods or five food categories that are bad for you. Those that either raise blood sugar too fast or that cause inflammation. We're going to go over those quickly and why that's bad. Everything else is great. And try to get, we'll talk about protein in a future webinar or maybe when we do it in uh, Phoenix in July. Um, and try to enjoy and prepare so you do extra virgin olive oil, salmon, foods with fiber, coffee, water, cooked tomatoes, leafy greens, and blueberries. And then there are a few supplements you should add. But those are the basic rules of nutrition. And as you can see, we're going to concentrate on numbers one and three today. My disclosure of interest, since I'm an academic, I did write these books. I do earn royalties on them. So I hope you all buy them. But in any case, Real Age, when it came out, the key was, and my real claim to fame is it displaced Harry Potter for seven days as number one on the New York Times list. When you, the owner's manual came out, it displaced Harry Potter for 35 days. And to show you how much people care about food, when you on a diet came out, it displaced Harry Potter for still the record, unless he comes back, but it was for 177 days as number one on Amazon. Um, those are the other conflicts. But I got motivated in this when I looked at the graph on aging. Most of us think you hit your peak quality of life between 25 and 35, and it's all downhill after that. And it is if you don't eat right. But if you look at the data on the IQ, and this is the IQ of Harvard physicians, you see their IQ on average goes down about 5% a year, um, which may be why you should choose a younger physician. But it turns out that if you look at the error bars, they go through no change at all. In fact, some of them actually improve. So we said, how do some people get to be one of the 25% of people that don't lose IQ points as they age. And food is really a key. Whether you're up here at the top or down here at the bottom depends a lot on the foods you choose to eat or not. So in 1994, we predicted that 2020, that by 2020, 60 would be the new 40. That's actually come to occur. And by the way, anyone is welcome to have this slide set. We'll put in a PDF and you can distribute it. But in this time in the nurses health study and the physician studies, when you look at it, that's exactly what happened. 60 is the new 40 of those who adopt healthy factors. This study also on one person motivated Jim and I this is from a patient who was turned down for coronary artery bypass surgery at Hopkins, came here, and he was turned down here as well. Why? Because this is the angiogram of his left anterior descending artery. And if you look at it, he has nothing to bypass to. And when he got turned down here, he ran into a guy named Dr. Esselstyn, who said to him, and he said to Dr. Esselstyn, what am I to do, just die? I can't walk five feet without having chest pain. And Essie said to him, no, you can change your diet and you can get healthier. Now he also did, got him to quit smoking 
and walk 10,000 steps a day. He said, I can't walk five steps. He said, you got a new job, walk five steps 2,000 times a day and did a little meditation as well. This is the same x-ray machine two and a half years later. This is before statins, before stents. This is mainly what diet did. He recovered this. And you'll notice a lot of the collateral arteries came back as well. It is food that gets to change this. Now, when this was done, we thought it was just a physiologic phenomenon of food. No, what happens is food changes which of your genes are on or not. And that really, we learned that with the Human Genome Project. They expected 300,000 genes based on the number of base pairs of DNA in your nucleus. They found only 22,500 only 1,500 of which were on at any one time. And all genes do is produce proteins. So they said, well, what was the rest of the DNA? They initially called it junk DNA. But seven years later, it was found to be switches that control which of your genes are on or not. That means when it was found that you control those switches, in fact, you control 80 to 93% of those switches and a major component of which of the person's genes are on or not, of your genes are what you eat and of your patron's genes of what you serve them. Food is a major component of which genes are on or not. You, your genes make your proteins and those proteins make you. And that's why you can have a do-over so you are the most important genetic engineer for you and probably the most ingen important genetic engineer for those you serve food to. This is stress management, and this is 25 nurses, not from the Cleveland Clinic, and these are strips of genes. It's called a heat map because red is those genes that are on. This is at N1 is before they took the stress management program. This is 16 weeks later, and this is a year later. Same 25 people. You'll notice these genes which are on largely get turned off. What do these genes do? They make inflammatory proteins. So stress management turned off those inflammatory proteins. They didn't do anything else. Conversely, down here, these are proteins that dampen or decrease inflammation. They turn those on and they started producing the anti-inflammatory proteins. So stress management and food are the two most important things that can be done for your health. And we'll come back to that. This is a study of 52 guys with prostate cancer. Here it is, the 52 over here, again, strips of genes, the red genes are on or producing proteins. Here it is a year later with them turned off. What are these genes? These are the five genes that produce, that are called the RAS family of genes that increase the growth of breast, prostate, and colon cancer. What did they do to turn these off? Well, the three guys out of the 52 who smoke quit smoking. They changed five foods in their diet. I'm going to show you those in a few seconds. They walked 10,000 steps a day and they meditated morning and night. Conversely, up here, these genes that are off and get turned on by the same actions, these two are the GSTM1 genes that cause prostate, colon, and breast cancer cells to commit suicide. Food was a major component of this. Now it's 14 years later when I last checked with Pete Carroll, who um, was the urologist involved in this, since he's had prostate cancer, only one of the 52 has progressed beyond this treatment for his prostate cancer. You and what you serve are powerful in changing which genes are on or not. Your genes make your proteins and your proteins make you and your health and you have control and your food choices are the second most important thing in genetic engineering. So when you look at it, blood pressure control, pretty darn important, cigarette cessation, 
eight to 12 year effect. Stress control up to 32 years, controlling your own health, getting your immunizations, that type of thing, getting checked with your cholesterol levels, et cetera. Quality and quantity of sex, people always like this, it's up to 16 years, but nutritional choices, 27 years. The second most important thing you can do to change your rate of aging. So um, nutrition is the second most important factor. And if you look at it, um, there are four major aspects that Jim says. It's you, it's the eating food that loves you back and a few supplements. It's when you want to eat in concert with your circadian rhythm and how Jim's going to talk about the techniques of preparation. I always like to throw a cartoon in or two um, it says all the chemical ingredients in this food were made by organic free range scientists. You don't have to worry about anything else. This stuff is all BS when you hear about that. That's bad science. Just concentrate on the seven rules we went through. Food is a relationship. Nutrition is food choices, portion size, and timing. Avoid the five snake oil foods that we'll go into in a few minutes those that either raise blood sugar too fast or that cause inflammation, everything else is great. Try and get more protein as you get older. We'll go into that in the future. Enjoy, try and enjoy it and prepare as you do. Extra virgin olive oil, salmon, foods with fiber, coffee, water, cooked tomatoes, leafy greens and blueberries. Those are the ones that have specific extra benefit and there are a few supplements you should do that slow your rate of aging. Now, let's go. What we're only going to talk about, as I said, rules one and three, and we're going to do that, if you will, pretty quickly. So first, where in the brain do you care about? It's the hippocampus. That's where your memory center is, and this is what happened when someone gets Alzheimer's disease. These hippocampal neurons shown in green, Red and blue gets smaller. The inflammation is the key in doing that. And food is key. Stress sets it up and then inflammation knocks off those neurons and makes them smaller. That is stress gets you to prune your neurons when you've got inflammatory food present. And that's why you have major roles in not only heart function and preventing cancer, but also in cognitive function. And I'm going to read this out. This is from the journal Neurology called Healthy Lifestyle and the Risk of Alzheimer's Disease. This is from two large studies. During a follow-up of 5.8 years in these studies, um, if you will, the incident of incidence of dementia when you look at the multivariable models, that means they looked at all the science and compared to participants with one to zero to one healthy lifestyle factor, the risk of Alzheimer's dementia was 37% lower. And in those with two or three uh, factors, it was lower by 37% and 60% lower in those with healthy lifestyles. This is solely the mind diet. So using a healthy diet, which we'll go through the principle of, is eliminating those five foods, a 60% reduction in dementia by that alone, by your food. You have major power over brains of your patients. You are the most important genetic engineer for the people you serve. Let's now go and talk about uh, the five snake oil foods. First, we're gonna talk about those that raise blood sugar too quickly. There are only three in that category, if you will, but I'm gonna go over the four major problems from a high blood sugar. You accumulate fat in your middle. That's the omental fat. Um, Jim doesn't have any of it, because so I couldn't demonstrate it on him. Gabby neither. Um, I try and not have any either, but that's what causes inflammation. So this is a fat cell, if you will, and where does it come from? Well, this shows sugar in your bloodstream and sugar in your bloodstream goes into your fat cells and makes them bigger. But the fat cells aren't inert. 
they secrete these things shown as yellow, which are cytokines. The cytokines reduce your muscle. They give you marbling. Marbling may be great on a piece of beef, but it's lousy in you because that's what happens. You don't want marbling, especially in the middle. So that's the first problem is you accumulate fat because of too high blood sugar level. That causes inflammation through that release of cytokines. The second thing is it attaches to proteins. Many of you will probably know that we measure hemoglobin A1C as a marker. All hemoglobin A1C is, is the hemoglobin with a sugar stuck in the A1C position. And that makes that hemoglobin malfunction. It doesn't release oxygen well enough. Well, the grout protein inside your arteries also gets dysfunctional when you get sugar on it. So this is, if you will, the inside of an artery. And what holds these cells together is a grout. So I'm going to start to show that, I hope. And I'm going to stop it right there if I can. Oops, I can't. But anyway, this is what happens when you get too high of blood pressure and the grout weakens with too blood sugar. It gets inflammation behind it and bang, oh, it ruptures. And after it ruptures, you get accumulation of these things called uh, platelets and they attract a lattice set of clotting factors and they stop those red cells from flowing. That's a heart attack or a stroke or a wrinkle of the skin or erectile dysfunction. Is there any difference between impotence and a wrinkle of the skin and a heart attack? No, it's just the arteries they cause it. The mechanism, that weakening of the border between the cells because you got glucose on the grout protein and then the shoving of the, um, if you will, the LDL cholesterol in there. I'm gonna run this back again. So what happens you get weakening of the grout protein, blood pressure comes down, causes a tear. You put this yellow stuff, LDL cholesterol in there. You then get inflammation behind it because of the food you're eating. Bang, it ruptures. That causes the platelets to accumulate. They trap the lattice network of clotting factors. They trap the red cells. That's a heart attack, stroke, impotence, wrinkle of the skin, um, dementia. Same process, and it all started with too high a blood sugar level and that second process, which is the glucose causing glycosylation of your protein, causing them to dysfunction. The third, you get increased kidney dysfunction because of it. And the fourth, if you will, I'm gonna skip over the slide, it's too technical, but basically when you get increased inflammation from what you eat, you cause inflammation in key cells in your kidney and that be, means the kidney becomes fibrotic tissue, which means that your kidney dysfunctions. The fourth is, in fact, you chronically decrease the production of um, capability of your mitochondria, which are the energy factories in your cell. So that's why you want to avoid, if you will, things that raise your blood sugar too fast. The other category you want to avoid is things that cause inflammation. So um, that is um, food that causes inflammation by changing your gut microbiome. Red meat and processed red meat. We used to think it was the, the saturated fat in it. Well, saturated fat has a role to play, but only if you get carnitine. That is, it takes both the saturated fat and the carnitine, they end up changing the bacteria to produce trimethylamine in you, goes to your liver and produces trimethylamine oxide, which causes atherosclerosis. It's a very inflammatory substance. Not only causes this, it increases cancer, it increases dementia as well. So in the studies, this is all cause mortality based on plasma trimethylamine oxide, which again increases with red meat, processed red meat. So it's the saturated fat plus carnitine are the main victims of this, main causes of this. And you can see 
a two or fourfold increase in all cause dementia at levels that are common in people who are meat eaters. Um, this is the freedom from heart attack. And again, the level of TMAO, the quartile, and you can see the risk of stroke um, increases greatly. And this is uh, myocardial infarction and stroke. So the key in preventing brain dysfunction, well, if you look at the 40 things we know that change your rate of brain dysfunction, but if you look at them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 12, and, and four, 17 of the 40 relate to food. Let me go through a few of those. So one of those is aromatherapy. Jim always cites that going in a kitchen is getting aromatherapy. I got to smell great garlic as Gabby prepared me some of my favorite shiitake mushrooms with red peppers, um, green beans, and a ton of garlic. And it was, and it still is great aroma here. You want four smells daily. So smell those foods um, and have your uh, patrons smell it. Because four smells daily decreases um, Alzheimer's disease um, in uh, two studies in humans. Those are the studies, again, you can have the, the survive at the end. How about coffee? It's one of the great drinks. Four more cups, decreased dementia and Parkinson's risk by more than 20%. Green and black tea may be the same. It, it's Half of it is the polyphenols, we think, because decaf is about half as effective as regular. It also decreases liver disease and at least eight cancers by more than 20% and you want it through a paper filter. In fact, one of the real problems we're now having in America is the plastic in the water. It's in our water supply. What's the best way of getting rid of plastic? It's boiling water and then putting it through a coffee filter, a paper filter. So you actually, by making coffee are, or running water through that, are preparing water that is the least contaminated, 99.999% of the plastic in tap water you get out by brewing coffee this way or brewing water this way. Um, and um, if you will, um, Jim and I, as uh, Jim knows, um, we do a uh, in the kitchen with Chef Jim and Dr. Mike, and we always go through important things. Jim has a great pecan uh, dessert, which is um, what we shared this day. But of course, the science of it was not only is pecans good because they have some omega-3 fatty acids, but coffee consumption is excellent as well. And extra virgin olive oil, a half tablespoon um, daily also decreases dementia risk and cardiovascular disease risk as well. Um, and uh, this is the benefits of using olive oil in place of margarine, butter, or other saturated fats. The other benefit you get from the other fat you should be using mm -hmm. is um, omega-3 fats. They decrease heart disease as well as cancer as well. And uh, this is dexahexanoic acid, which is in salmon and ocean trout. 93% of the fat in the key conducting areas of your brain is DHA, and in the retina, we're seeing better, 93% is. I know I'm going very fast, so I'm just going to show you, uh, when you get the slides, you'll see a lot of the references as well. The key, change your attitude. You are a genetic engineer for you and for those you serve. Only eat food you love and loves you back. You're going to need a team. None of us can do this on our own. That's why we have chefs and docs working together and sous chefs too. Add speed to your body and brain, smells, coffee and olive oil daily. And especially thank you for letting us do this together because I consider Jim part of my posse and getting to help people live younger is my purpose. Remember, your genes make your proteins. Those proteins make you and your health, and you can control those 
food is a powerful way. So you are a genetic engineer for you and for the people you serve. You can find out more if you want by going to longevityplaybook.com, signing up for the free newsletter. It always has a cartoon on it, as you can see. With everything else I've got to do on my mind, you tell me I've got to think about breathing too. Um, so that's the one when you talk about meditation. Um, as uh, you know, you can increase your and your clients' productive years by cooking food you love and that loves you back. So getting back to it, you are a genetic engineer for you. Only eat food you love and that loves you back. Choose a team. Now, I normally say you want that team to include a female. Why? Because a male coach is generally lousy. Now, this is a guy who is finishing his walk with a little trotting, and he's going to stretch out. His coach is coming along. I'm not even going to comment that his coach is having a candy bar, which raises his blood sugar too fast. But he sees him, and he's a guy. No questions asked. He immediately takes action and helps him. That's a male buddy. You really want a female buddy. A female buddy encourages you to walk a little faster. And when you need to be picked up, your female buddy comes along and gives you a lift. I have a great couple of buddies here in Gabby and Jim. And now it's Jim's turn. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Doc. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to try to get done in time so Gabby could even maybe do a little demo for you. So, uh, Doc gave you the science. I'm going to show you now slides on how we apply that science. And this is what chefs, you, my colleagues, could do. Um, this was 10 years ago in the Wall Street Journal. And what resonated in me was when it said a delicious prescription, right? And, uh, you know, they say food is medicine. Well, yeah, it is, but that's nutrition. Culinary medicine, the first word is culinary. We want to make that taste good. And I try to emphasize that in the article that was in the NCR, right? Now, when it comes to the science, there's so many different docs and they all have their own opinion on it. And it's hard for patients to navigate it. It's hard to navigate that. It's hard for us to navigate that as well. A lot of different opinions. But in terms of culinary medicine, right, in 2008, uh, Dr. John LaPuma, who I had the pleasure to do at Dr. Roizen's medical conference in Chicago, we did a, a cooking demonstration together. He started the mainstream of culinary medicine. 10 years later, in 2018, Dr. David Eisenberg from the Harvard School of Public Health Department of Nutrition, who founded the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, which, by the way, I think that's what ACF could be doing are all the things that they're doing. Um, there were 30, it was an NIH funded research day. There were 36 different abstracts of which actually Cleveland Clinic won the award for the best oral presentation, mostly because it had the data that Dr. Roizen, you know, worked on and that, um, but I saw 36 different interpretations of what people think culinary medicine is. Michelle Hauser, who first, before she went to medical school, became a chef, worked with Alice Waters, and then she went to uh, medical school, did this curriculum. It's in over, for free for anyone, and it's now over in over 100 countries. Fast forward to 23, and last year was the first time I ever saw the words culinary medicine on the signature publication of today's of the American Academy of Dietetics, today's dietitian. Uh, we've been doing it at Cleveland Clinic. When Dr. Roizen became chair of the Wellness Institute, we started our first pilot of Lifestyle 180 in 2008. But at Cleveland Clinic, what we message culinary medicine to be is that it combines the evidence-based science of food and now the science can be across the board. So we try to take the strongest science of food, nutrition, and medicine with the joy and art of cooking. And it weaves in multiple disciplines. So yes, it weaves in aromatherapy. 
you certainly have hospitality. Think of Thanksgiving and all the things we do for our customers, right? And you certainly have functional exercise with all the chopping, the cooking, cleaning, washing pots and pans, gardening, and so on. But at the end of the day, this is what culinary medicine really is and what we message it to be. Culinary medicine takes nutritional science and it makes it taste good. So no matter what patient, any patient that what, no matter what diet, any patient is prescribed to follow, right? Crohn's diabetic, cardiac, celiac, FODMAP, it doesn't matter. Every patient should enjoy their food. So we created a nutrition and culinary medicine toolkit for Tossic Cancer Center. If there's a cancer patient that's got a head and neck cancer that is prescribed to be on a textured modified diet, minced and chopped, or even more extreme puree, then that puree should taste good. That gives that patient quality of life, right? And we are a powerful tool in a physician's medicine bag. Sure, we want everybody to love the foods that love you back, but that's going to be different for everybody. Someone with celiac disease, glue is not going to love them back, right? And yeah, we want to eat the rainbow because you got all the different phytonutrients in every single color. But how do we teach people to begin? We ask them to consider all the things they not they can have and not to think about the things that they are advised or prescribed not to have. So for the celiac patient, <clears throat> they can't have gluten. It'll just make their symptoms worse, right? So instead, we want them to think about all the things they can have, all the greens that are gluten-free, right? And you can't love what you don't know, right? How is the celiac patient going to know they don't like millet if they never had it, right? So that's so important. Here's where chefs can help because we have experience in so many different cultures and so many different cuisines and foods that we can help these patients. Chefs can be, you know, um, John Foles once said, I was at the convention when he said that ACL is the authority of cooking in America. Boy, we sure are, and we could do this. We just got to get more people to think this way. We did the first ever culinary medicine workshop at Cleveland Clinic at Dr. Royson's Medical Conference in 2019 in Las Vegas. These are all docs. They went into salon, they got the lecture like we're given now, but then they went, the chef was really nice there. He let us go into the banquet kitchen and they practice knife skills, which are so important because no matter what diet any patient is prescribed to follow, you still gotta know how to hold that knife in your hand more importantly, how to hold the food in your other hand. And that's why, you know, Gabby's going to be doing a competition coming up. They're going to be judging her on knife skills. That's why UCF stresses that. That's why it's so important. And you, my colleagues, are masters at doing this. And this one here I love because food is medicine and culinary medicine and literacy are now becoming powerful tools in a physician's medicine bag. Dr. Royzen was ahead of his time. He was teaching students decades ago, you know, and he's done all those books you saw. But now more and more docs are doing that, especially the new ones in medical schools today. Here's another example, right? So California State University, uh, the Maryland Mongrand Center for Food Science and Nutrition Dietetics. Here at where a chef paired up with a dietitian and a physician to, you know, uh, message culinary medicine. Uh, here, uh, this is a, a good friend, Dr. Milan Golubic, now at Cincinnati. This is at the Culinary Institute, Hyde Park, New York, during uh, Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Life segment. But this is where Dr. Eisenberg launched Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, was right here at that campus for CIA. And, but it gives you an example how chefs and diet uh, physicians could work together. This was our teaching kitchen that no longer exists because the Cleveland Clinic demolished that building for reasons I'm not going to get into now, but uh, it was a 108-acre campus and it wasn't uh, doable anymore. But so now I, I want to show you all the things you can do in a teaching kitchen. This was one of them. This is a shared well, medical you appointment. You that you're in a teaching kitchen now. Well, that's right. Thank you, Doc. So the kitchen I'm presenting to you now is our replacement teaching kitchen. It's in the Cleveland Clinic administrative campus. 
So we pivoted. It took about seven months, but now we're in our own new kitchen. This is our home base now. It was existing and we're, it was idle for eight years. And now we've converted it into a teaching kitchen. This is a breast cancer shared medical appointment. Every woman here had breast cancer, but this is what we were doing now, how they could make healthier foods, right? You know, to improve their condition. Uh, this, after COVID happened, we couldn't do shared medical appointments in person, so we pivoted to virtual. This is a patient here, and she, this was uh, Dr. Sandra Darling is the physician. So this was a culinary medicine for chronic disease shared medical appointment. And this is a patient in her kitchen cooking together with us. We would send them the shopping list, the mise en place list, what it is, what's important. We give them a toolkit, all the things they need. Then we would cook together. This is what chefs could do. Um, and then, so th we're starting that up again and we'll be doing that now. This is our toxic cancer center. Uh, and these are the upcoming dates we're going to be doing with Tossa Cancer Center for the Nutrition and Culinary Medicine Program to help cancer patients and their care support persons. Um, this is the worldwide classroom teaching children in high schools. We had did four states, probably a dozen different schools and a couple hundred kids all streamed out of our kitchen. Um, I don't know if you guys will remember, but this is another example that chefs could do. We won, uh, for Food is Knowledge, the first annual Chef and Child Award right here on the NCR, November 1991. This was at Lakewood Hospital. That's a sink two feet off the ground the hospital built for us. And this was to teach children nutrition in schools by their teacher, by integrating food and nutrition with academics. Another example on chefs, how chefs can help. These are anesthesiology residents. We would do life skills with every class. We started with them in 2014, culinary medicine sessions in our kitchen. But every cohort that came into our kitchen, they all did knife skills, all anesthesiology residents, which by the way, Dr. Royzen didn't mention, but he, when he came here to Cleveland, he was the chair of anesthesiology and he's also board certified in internal medicine. Um, this is a patient proudly showing what he made in a study. This was called the Honor Project at our Stephanie Tubbs Jones Health Center and uh, another example of working with patients. We also redid the cooking manual for the Boy Scouts of America on a national level. So when a Boy Scout would go to get their merit badge, you know, we try to have them get their merit badge doing healthier methods of preparation and meals. Um, first responders are in every town in this country. They all have kitchens. And so we try to show, you know, you want your first responders to be healthy when they got to climb them ladders and rescue you from a third floor when your house is on fire, right? So we did in their kitchen and firefighters, they, you know, and this is, I think I got the last slide because they're a lot like chefs in the sense that chefs love to burn and char everything. You don't want to do that. Firefighters, they love to grill. And so we wanted to show them how you could grill without any burning and charring and to avoid excess smoke because of all the carcinogens associated with that as, the, as science tells us. These are members of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, right? There are now 55 members in December 23. You know, I wish I could see ACF on here, but this is where I show this because they're teaching kitchens. This is what ACF needs to get to. And we have the power to go in this direction with our competitions, not just doing cold food with ASMIC or some of our categories to make fancy things that go into high-end clubs and restaurants and the Ritz and all, but to do something that would be good for a school cafeteria, that would be my dream to work with ACF to design something like that. Uh, this is an article on teaching kitchens. We were featured in it, but this lady that came into our kitchen actually got off of all her insulin from her type 2 diabetes. Um, 
There, we do articles for, we work with rheumatology at Cleveland Clinic. This was the arthritis advisor. We just did one there. Uh, this is another one, recipes to boost your immune system. Or do, I'm doing a podcast in a few weeks coming up. And I'm really proud of this one because I'm, I'm not sure if I am the first chef in the country to do this or not, but I think I am the first one to do a culinary medicine consult that is charted in your medical records in Epic, chefs don't chart in medical records, dietitians and doc do, docs do and medical providers. The clinic went ahead and did this. It took about nine months to make it happen, but why is this so important? Because it's easy to get a dietary you know, advisement from a dietitian that tells you what foods to include and what to avoid, but chefs have the power to show people how they could prepare that by what their food preferences are, their knowledge about recipes and techniques, their ability to cook and prepare. And what if they can't stand for a long period of time? Or if they only have mobility on one side because they have a stroke? What's available in your kitchen? They all have different stuff. And what family support? Do they have a support person, a care person, or do they live alone? And last but not least, then we look at their dietary restrictions and then we help them make a food, a food and cooking plan so they don't compromise the taste of their meals or their health so they could sustain the dietary changes they're being advised to do by their medical provider. When we create the curriculum at Cleveland Clinic Culinary Medicine Programming, we do a technique-driven curriculum. What I mean by that is that we try to show people how to make things moist without fat, sweet without sugar, and all these things that you see. And if I could show one patient how to make something sweet without adding sugar to one thing, then they know the technique, they could do it to 10 different other things and it'll transcend any type of diet. It's a technique, right? We created the toolkit. You can see these are all the components of the toolkit. And now we even did this, a spinoff for people with chronic kidney disease. Um, you know, we put potassium and phosphorus into the nutritional analysis for them. And uh, you could do many variations of this, but it's, a, it's a, a way to support and help our patients. We created a knife skill video, it's 58 minutes long. We give them this handout on how to hold a knife because as you all know how important that is. And if you want, we even partner, chefs can partner with national organizations. The American Culinary Federation always wants to get press and, and you know, I challenge them instead of looking at competitions, consider something like this. We partner with the National Arthritis Foundation. They created an ebook that has 23 recipes that are fight inflammation. They're anti-inflammatory, right? It's all on their dime and they're promoting it on a national level. This is things that ACF could be a part of and do. If you want these recipes, all you got to do is Google arthritisfoundation.org, Cleveland Clinic recipes. It'll pop up and you can download the ebook for yourself. Um, these are what Dr. Royzen talked about, our videos. So what we give our patients is this. And you can even do this with your phone on the slide if you want. This QR code, 28 pages of our toolkit. This QR code, 113 episodes of In the Kitchen with Chef Jim, Dr. Mike. This QR code has all the services on our culinary medicine website. This is what we give to medical students, what we give to patients. Physicians could even put this in their after visit summary if they wanted to, to help patients sustain the behaviors they're trying to change. That's why it's a powerful tool in their medicine bag. Here's some examples. Papa's pumpkin pie list. I don't do pumpkin pie in Thanksgiving for my four grandsons. I would make the vegan pumpkin mousse. But to them, it's Papa's pumpkin pie. To them, that's a new tradition that's going to love their little bodies back. Mac and cheese, let's make a vegan version, right? So to do that, if we took 28 ounces of sweet potatoes and four cups alternative milk, put it, uh, cook it down, right? Takes about 20 minutes, bring it back up to three cups, put it in a blender with either tofu or cashews, salt, pepper, Dijon, mustard, nutmeg, cayenne. Look at it, it comes out just like a cheese sauce, put it over whole grain pasta. It's outstanding. It's anti-inflammatory. Why is that important? This is why. There's a tsunami of opposition that works against us right here. This was in our local paper, Meals with Soul. Of course, they didn't give a nutritional analysis, and of course, they didn't give a portion size. So they just gave a 9 by 13 pan. We compared it to ours. You can see in red here. 
1,300 milligrams of cholesterol, we didn't have any. They had over 7,500 milligrams of sodium. That contributes to hypertension. Hypertension contributes to diabetes. Diabetes is the number one cause of kidney disease. You could see 190 grams of saturated fat. We had 13 too. That's why we need to do this. That's the power chefs can have. I'm going to try to hurry up so Gabby can demonstrate this for you. You know, Dr. Royce mentioned about carnitine and meat, um, but he also could mention about the lecithin and choline that's in an egg yolk that also can contribute to TMAO. So if you have an alternative version of mayonnaise, mayonnaise got egg yolks, they got added sugar, they got oil. Alternative versions like veggies will just have the oil, but there's 120 calories in a tablespoon of oil, right? Cashew nays, only oil in the cashew, three different acids. The only added sugar was a raisin, right? So we made raisin reductions, equal parts, raisins and water, right? Rehydrate it, reduce it down three tablespoons, blend it. It's good in your freezer for three months, right? It's good for desserts, good for savory, right? Um, it's outstanding, but it also has allulose. Dr. Roizen could talk so much more about this than me, but I want Gabby to do this demo, so I'm going to try to hurry up. But here's the science now that it's showing that allulose can help other sugars from being blocked and absorbed into your blood. You guys can Google that on your own and check it out. So any kind of grain, doesn't matter. Rice, quinoa, doesn't matter. I try to challenge, encourage everybody to moisten that grain with plants. If you got one part grain, four or five part plants, you'll moisten that grain with plants. A close up of that. This is farro, but it's jumping with moisture and flavor. You got mushrooms. They're not an animal. They're not a plant. They're a fungus. They have cardiovascular benefits. And they also loaded with moisture and flavor. You can get umami when you brown a, a, a shiitake and mushrooms, right? You can see the green spinach, whatever kind you want. <clears throat> Tomatoes, when you cook them, you increase their lycopene, but you also caramelize the naturally occurring sugars. And they're also a source of umami. That's why kids like ketchup, right? And you can see all the things going on in there. Those are things we could do to help kids be healthier. Um, potatoes, instead of having the sour cream on a baked potato, and a dietitian might advise them to use non-fat Greek yogurt instead, I would challenge you to take plants. And if you roast your potatoes and you combine them with plants, you get all the different phytonutrients in all these different colors, the dark leafy greens, you could just wilt in and you moisten the potato with plants. If you have a purple Peruvian potato, you get the same anthocyanins that are in the blueberries that Dr. Ryzen had on his side, right? You get the carotenes in the colors that are yellow. So plants are a great way to go. Vinaigrette right? Classically, they still teach this in schools today, three to one ratio, right? Uh, a, a, a tablespoon of oil, no matter what kind you're talking, 120 calories, it's caloric, right? So if you take, if you do a one-on-one, -on -one, which we advise never to go over that, we just took legumes, macerate them in our hands, mash it, and we are now emulsifying. We create that emulsion with the legumes, a source of plant-based fiber and protein, and that will love their bodies back, as Dr. Royston talks about. But here's the thing. If you had hummus for breakfast or legumes, you get a 71% reduction in your blood glucose spike. And if you didn't have any for lunch, you get a second meal effect and a 38% reduction. We can help our patients and our customers and those we serve right to think that way and eat that way. And here's how you make a vinaigrette or a dressing with no added oil, no added sugar, or no added sodium. Three figs, three prunes, three quarter cup of water, cover pot, reduce it down a few tablespoons, put it in the blender or processor with a half a cup of blueberries, half a cup of balsamic vinegar, garlic, pepper, mustard, but it comes out really thick, super sweet, but look what happened. Where does sugar come from? The figs, the prunes, the berries, right? But also, if prunes got loaded with calcium, but when people are constipated, they notch on a prune. They're a great source of dietary fiber. So a great way to get your sugar and sweeten something is with the fiber attached, right? 
we all need more dietary fiber in our diet. And this is, I think, my one of my last ones. I had to put this up for my chef colleagues here because they're burning the heck out of everything, right? There's a mountain of evidence of carcinogens associated when you black or burn anything. I hope you guys look into that science. So the take home points, yay, Gabby, get ready, Gabby, you. you're next, okay? Plug it in. Um, take home points. The American Culinary Federation, ACF, has a great opportunity to collaborate in the new and growing field of culinary medicine. And culinary medicine is a powerful, powerful tool in a physician's medicine bag that ACF chefs can help to strengthen. And we have an opportunity, ACF chefs have an opportunity to partner with dietitians and physicians to help each other promote wellness and well-being to all those that we serve. Gabby will do a quick little demo on the cashew nays, then we'll be able to take a few questions. Okay, Gabby. All right, yeah, it's very quick. And one second, let me get my gloves on. I have to say thank you to Chef Dim for letting me have this opportunity and to ACF as well, obviously, for letting us promote culinary medicine here nationally. And Chef Royzen, or Dr. Royzen for being the best. Okay. I don't know if this is in the center of my camera here, but I hope you guys can see. I have, so I have, for cashew needs, Chef Jen gave a really quick, um, you know, the nutrition and the reason why we are making this recipe. It says, it says they should um, put me on oh, my video. Do I put share this? Uh, here. Oh, stop sharing. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay, I can't see myself, but that's okay. Um, so this recipe is really great. It's in the What to Eat When cookbook that uh, Chef um, put in with Dr. Royzen. And to start, we have some soaked cashews, soaked overnight, just plain raw cashews. And again, this is a recipe that can be a substitute for mayonnaise. And even after a few days, it kind of gets into like cream cheese. So there's a lot of different variations that you can have with this recipe. I have three different acids. I have some apple cider vinegar, some lemon juice, and a little bit of distilled vinegar. Some fresh garlic, just like Dr. Royce said, we love garlic in this kitchen, always cooking with garlic. And then some uh, dried mustard, a little bit of salt, and cayenne. I'm gonna try to hurry up so you guys can take questions. I have um, a quarter cup of water. And then the last thing with that raisin reduction, that Chef Jim mentioned, it's equal parts. You reduce it down and you get kind of like a, a raisin puree. It kind of comes out like baby food, but it freezes really well. You can keep it in the freezer for about three months. This is a great option to keep for savory dishes. You know, put it in sauces, just to add that sweetness without that added sugar and you get the fiber and the allulose attached. So I'm just gonna do a quick blend. I'm using a Vitamix. We know we got, as chefs, we have to have the right tool for the right job. And the Vitamix is really great. So I'm just going to do a quick blend. <laughs> Got to have a tamper. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear me, but you want to make sure it gets nice and smooth. And I probably for the sake of time, I won't do the whole thing. Yeah, Gabby, don't worry about the time. Uh, we're actually going to do the questions afterwards. So it'll give Chef Jim and, and uh, Doctor a little bit extra time to ask, answer the questions. So take your time with the demo. We want to hear about what you're making. Oh, thank you. Okay, he said they were doing okay on time, but okay. so, but we do have it done already, just like a regular cooking show. Got to have it done, um, but it comes out really nice and smooth. I don't know if it's going to zoom in on here, but you can leave it in the fridge for a couple weeks. You could add dill. You could add other spices or you know different herbs, Turn parsley. It. Turns into cream cheese. Really great on maybe some whole grain toast with some lots or something in the morning. Um, but definitely a great option. Um, instead of getting that the saturated fat from from the egg yolks. Okay, right, Chris, we can take a question if someone's Thank got you. one real fast. Thank you, Gabby. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, let me uh let me pull see what I got here real quick. So I've got about five questions. What I'm going to do is I'll, I'll ask one or two of the questions just so we can uh, answer them. And then we've got quite a few that I'll send to you, you uh, gentlemen afterwards. And you can answer a little bit more detail, I think. So uh, one of, one of the questions I liked here was uh, how can you how can this affect school food uh, school food service 
And uh, how many people can access this information in a school or program? Um, does the food and eating habits change uh, with those living environments that they are with those schools? We, I think we had trouble hearing you, Chris. Okay, let me try it again. Said, so how can this information that you gave us today, especially Dr. Royzen, how can this information uh, be translated to different ways for schools, and how can people access for uh, for after schools or during school programs? So, can you? So, do you want to talk about how the information will be glad to uh, provide any place? And what we've done it, with schools, Jim, I'm going to let Jim talk about, because he has a special program called Food is Knowledge. You want to talk about Food is Knowledge? Yeah, so if anybody wants to know about Food is Knowledge, I did that with ACF <laughs> in the early 90s. Um, and so, I'm Chris, you know me. All you got to do is you contact me, and I could set up a whole separate thing all about Food is Knowledge again. And I'm happy to do that. Uh, it's hard to get food, nutrition, education in schools. Food is knowledge successfully did that. Um, and I'm happy to have a separate conversation and, on that. And, and in fact, we've been asked, uh, Jim has been asked to do this for the Cleveland inner ring schools again. Um, we had so much trouble getting it in, if you will, the first time schools are resistant. They're now getting a, not only um, desirous, but they're actually trying to get it in. So Jim's Jim Jim is in great demand, but he has a kit. And uh, I am sure, Chris, that he would make that kit available to everyone. Yeah, I, I will say to everyone that's asked that question on the call, um, that's one of the things Chef Perkle and I have been talking about for years. And as he alludes to, there's a lot of things and opportunities for the ACF to grow. Uh, Chef Perko and I have been talking about this. As much as he's talking about that we need to change, we are changing. And that's one of the reasons why we did this trend for the this trend for the trend report so we can have that opportunity for it. So uh, we will be working on that together. And even uh, Chef Perko and I have been talking about get, creating a, a to bring the kid in. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> So we're also going to be working on a culinary medicine certificate for all of you members as well. So that's going to be a a, um, a, a culinary medicine certificate that will be fantastic for everybody. Now let's talk, let's take at least one more question, and we'll probably have to take the rest of them offline that we can send out to everyone. Uh, can you comment on how vitamin D churns on genes during uh, genes helping the immune system? Can I comment on vitamin D? How that vitamin D churns on genes during uh, helping the immune system. Um, yeah, vitamin D, we don't know all the genes it turns on, but it turns on a specific gene that patrols the gene, the rest of your genome for changes. Um, so one of the things it does is uh, genes do two things. They make proteins or they watch other genes, and vitamin D turns on another gene that watches the genes for abnormalities and tries to kill the abnor the cells with those abnormalities before it can reproduce. So that's one of the ways it stops cancer. Um, it, it plus vitamin, uh, some of the vitamin E uh, cogeners, so D and E together, are important at clearing inflammation after it starts. So rather than letting it keep going, they're involved in, in the... Uh, scavenging operation afterwards to get you back to normal. So there are some, we're, we're at the beginning stages of learning how uh, food turns on and food and supplements turn on genes and turn off genes. All right, I got one more one more question I have to ask because I, I like this question as it came through, um, especially with uh, the cost of food and inflation and, and all the expense with food right now. What are some of the ways that uh, people at home can help out with um, the different food uh, food items they can buy um, to to help with their inflammation, blood pressure, et cetera, and, and help help out their heart with the especially with food costs today? Um, one one of the best is uh, getting canned and frozen foods that are much cheaper, um, and uh, one of the least expensive sets of foods that we know are legumes, including peanuts. Um, and those are all anti-inflammatory when uh, they're not made with a lot of sugar on them or uh, uh, salt on them. So, um, but legumes, whether chickpeas or peanuts, et cetera, or beans, 
all of those things are anti-inflammatory. So I showed coffee, um, and uh, you, the uh, if you will, as Jim knows, I am a salmon freak because it has sick. Um, and uh, um, if you will, I get uh, frozen salmon burgers, at, and I have no stock in the company at Costco. Very inexpensive per serving, and uh, really healthy. So, but but peanuts are by far the cheapest. But Chris, there's also the food bank, there's food pharmacies, there's co-ops. Chefs work with so many different farmers that provide foods that help other people as well, such as the food bank and that. And then there's the big movement of the ugly food, as you know, the foods that the grocery stores don't want to put out and the chefs have the power how to work with those people to utilize those foods so they don't go into compost or a landfill. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity, Chris. We're we're privileged to be here. No, it's uh it's all our it's our privilege, and, and with uh, Chef Jim, uh, having known you for you know pretty much two decades, I've heard Dr. Royson's name for so many years, and uh, now meeting Gabby, I'm uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. So, um, uh, certainly a huge virtual round of applause as we thank thank the three of you for your informative presentation. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to share your important insights in culinary medicine with our ACF community of culinary professionals. Uh, please be on the lookout for the survey we'll receive, you'll receive in the next day or so, which you'll need to complete your CEH uh, units, chefs. Um, we hope that you'll join us for the next webinar on April 3rd as we present on the basics of baking with cannabis with the Retail Bakers Association as an introduction for April's trend. Then on April 10th, Chef Nathan will be presenting on properly pressed cannabis rosin for culinary cannabis infusion. Right. We also look forward to seeing all of it at the ACF National Convention in Phoenix, July 14th through 17th. It's going to be the can't miss culinary education event of the year for sure. And you're going to see these gentlemen here again also for that presentation. And it's going to be much bigger and uh, much, more, uh, much more content. So you don't want to miss that. To learn more about the upcoming webinars and the ACF National Convention, visit, visit acfchefs.org and click on the events tab. On behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to our presenters for the bringing us this opportunity. And thank you all, all of you for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Thanks.